And we'll pretty much go ahead and uh, we'll get started. We'll pretty much have uh, everything moving along through the book of Philemon. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, so far what we've done is we've gone through the first, I believe it's the first 15 verses. And just to reread what we've already gone through, just in our intro, our study today. So far we've got uh, you know, verse, verse 1 being, you know, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, uh, even our dearly beloved a laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. We have great joy and consolation of thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bond, which in time past was the unprofitable, but now profitable unto me, whom I have sent him down therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have uh, retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Uh, without thy mind would I do nothing, uh, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. That's where we left off. We did those first uh, 15 verses over the past. I believe we've been doing this since about January 16th or so. That's when we first started this uh, letter, uh, this epistle. So we've been going for a good month and a week so far. Maybe a good five weeks. This is the fifth week, perhaps, going through this. And then, of course, we have the other lessons as well. But we're still far in our study, just the first three verses, the introduction. We Again, just to go through this, just to you know, rehash everything was that the first three verses was the introduction. Paul you know, was saying he was writing to Philemon in the church in his house. And then verses uh, four through six was his thankfulness for Philemon's you know, love and faith, prepared for the uh, communication of his faith, and it works effectually. In seven and nine, he's thankful that the bowels of the saints are refreshed by Philemon, and Paul rejoices in that. And then uh, he moves on stating that uh, you know, rather than enjoining him concerning an Onesimus, he's going to beseech him gracefully. And so we saw that over a vast number of reasons. And then as we kept going through verses uh, 10 through 13, we saw the start of his plea. Paul starts pleading the case of an Onesimus, case back to Philemon, uh, about uh, everything concerning Onesimus that we start getting into as we read further into what we're seeing. And then verses 14 and 15, we see Paul's plea you know, further into in more details that he won't do anything without the consent of Philemon and the purpose of for the departure, perhaps the purpose of the departure of Anesim in the first place. So this is where it's all been going so far, at least. They which have added the uh, flavor or the theme or the study of Philemon. We've had so far our studies which had to do with our topical studies of Philemon and slavery. We did the study on that. We did the study of Anesim's spiritual growth. We looked into that. Uh, we studied about being refreshed by the scriptures, like we read about in some of the verses in Philemon. Uh, we did a study, um, even an open conversation we did last week about Onesimus, you know, what he could have been thinking as he was going through everything about Philemon, what he was thinking about as he was going through everything, and even as Paul, as he was going through everything, based on the doctrines of the grace of God working in all three in this conversation through the Roman Empire at the time. So we've had these topical studies on Wednesday. We're doing our verse by verse here now on Sundays. And so we're, we're getting into Philemon. Through, we're, we're, we're attacking this book through all sorts of different angles, whether it be open conversation, whether it be verse by verse, whether it be topical study. We're trying to approach these this 25 verse epistle through all sorts and you know, allowing perfectly in this as we need and study it and show ourselves approved, rightly divide it and allow it to uh, work effectually. So so far. And then as we go into it this week, we'll continue with the verses 16, 17, and 18. And as, as we go through it, continue to see what we from it. And of course, we see that the verses are going to read as we see here. It says um, in verse 16, not now as a servant, as Paul continues his plea and, and uh, besiegement, not as a servant, but above a servant, brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? 
me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. <clears throat> and then he's going to continue even more from there. But we'll just look at those three verses today as we continue to go through this epistle. And of course, there's a lot of different things we can read and see, a lot of verses we can line up with it, and that's what we're looking to do. So we see in verse 16, he starts out, he's saying, not now as a servant, but above a servant. So as we see there, he's talking more about the identity that um, Paul's looking to have Philemon receive an Esimus back. At. And he's saying that uh, back in verse 15, he's saying, uh, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, thou shouldest receive him forever, not as a servant, but above a servant. Is how he's referring to Onesimus as. So he's referring to you know the identity of uh, Onesimus now. And we know that when one trusts the gospel, that that changes the identity of the believer as far as how God sees the believer, uh, how God sees the individual. When they trust his gospel, what God is, and the good news of what God has, and they trust the gospel, they're seeing uh, God sees the individual as from you know, being lost to being saved. So we see this here, and the cross changes in, in, the, in essence who as far as our identity. We look, for example, on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, just as a starting point here. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for a good reference verse, a good, a good point that it mentions here. And it goes here to say that... Uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be all made, to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And we're seeing just the body of Christ, and it gives an application to you know, not one man, one body. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says, Now we are the body of Christ, and members, and says, you know, who we are. This is who Onesimus became a member of when he trusted the gospel, a member of the body of Christ. So we see that coming to play here. We're talking about you know, being above the servant. This is how he's above the servant now, in his identity in Christ. Uh, he still is you know, towards Philemon, his servant. But he's above the servant. He's more than a member of the body, a member of Christ's body. So we're seeing how this change takes place. We're seeing at least the identity, change in identity takes place through trusting the gospel. We'll give it at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. We see more about this. Romans 6 1 goes on to explain even more concerning the church, the body of Christ. And talks about, you know, again, that, that baptism into Christ concerning the identity of the believer. In this case, we're looking at it through, you know, Onesimus, how he's more than a servant. And we see that starting in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course, the answer being, God forbid, shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So we see that through our identity by trusting the gospel, we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Therefore, so was this. He went into Paul, trusted the gospel, learned uh, through his spiritual growth what we saw through that study, that uh, he trusted the gospel, he's baptized, and this and this was baptized into Jesus Christ. Therefore, as he's sent back, he's more than a servant. He's a member of the body. He's a member of Christ's body, just as Philemon is, just as Paul is. So he has a part to play. He has uh, a piece, a part B in the in the body, the body part now, in, in Christ's body. So he's more than a servant. So we see that there, and then it's the death and resurrection that changes the identification. We know this if we look at Galatians chapter 2, in verse 20. This is where we see this. Concerning you know, the identity, Onesimus, more than a servant. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It goes on the reading says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. So we see that in verse 20, concerning his identity, I am crucified with Christ. That's that's the identity of Paul in talking there. Nevertheless, I live. And so we understand we are also crucified with Christ based on what we read in Romans 6. And uh, we even know this plugging him into and cross-referring to everything in 1 Corinthians 12. 
the body of Christ, we're members of his body, we're crucified with Christ, we're baptized into Christ. This is our identity based on what Christ did for us. And we believe that, we trust that. So we see that in Galatians 2.20. I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is how an essence can be more than a servant. And this is how we see this play out and where we're talking about in verse 16 of Philemon. So we see that death and resurrection changes our identification. We can impute what Christ has done to our very identification as God sees us today. This is how we do this. So right, how God does this and we understand this. So, And then the way we can further is Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. This is due to God's operation, not, not our own personal operation. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 explains this. It's the faith of the operation of God. God's operation. Operation of God, in other words. So, this is due to God's operation that all this can take place. So all this does take place when we believe the gospel. And we see that in Colossians 2.11, as it goes on to explain a little more, it says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hand, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of buried with him baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. But you see that there, I believe it's in verse uh, 12. It's through the faith of the operation of God. So God has operations going. When you trust the gospel, that that operation takes place. And you don't, again, we've said it before, you don't see it or smell it or feel it, but the Bible explains that it does take place. When you trust the gospel. And your identity is therefore changed according to the verse, and there's a lot more. You know that Onesimus will be going back to Philemon, as we'll see more as we study it, more than a servant. So he's saying, Philemon, don't receive Onesimus as just the way he left as a servant. He's going back more than a servant. He's, as he said before in previous verses, he's my own bowels. Receive him as myself, we'll look at today. And so we'll see this playing out in the book of Philemon. So that there in uh, but this is all due to God's operation. And so we see this there, and it's not based on our works. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, before, and going back to the important notes of the identity of the believer, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. We see here it says, and put on the new man which is uh, created, I'm sorry, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this is what the new man is, created uh, in righteousness and true holiness. This is what the operation of God uh, for. We have that Romans 7 all the time, but we do have a new man that they actually in us. We have to decide, as Romans 6 talks about, to put it on and to put off the uh, old man. Put off the old man, put on the new man. We have to reckon to do so. So we see that from Romans 6, we see it here in Ephesians 4, based on the previous verses we've been looking at, and the place here. And even going back to this, where it says that uh, a matter of reckon, we reckon and done, as we start to say that a moment ago, you look at uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Going back to Romans 6, Romans 6, 11, all that the Bible talks about, from the Bible rightly divided, King James Bible rightly divided, when we study it and we read it, we study and we read what we read, then we go and reckon it to be simple. We reckon it to be true. We don't just uh, allow it to kind of float off, disappear, dissipate, go away. We, just, we read it, it's great, and then we just allow it to play. No, we reckon it to and we solicit see there in verse 11, reckon, so likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be indeed and to understand God through Jesus the Lord. So there's some things we have to reckon concerning the truth, concerning our identity, concerning uh, these things in Christ. And this is what we see here when it comes to Philemon being um, the one who's going to receive. And uh, as we continue in verse, back to the book of Philemon. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. He says, a brother beloved, especially to me. Uh, but we see he says a brother beloved. We see that Paul has had a lot of beloved brothers he's worked with, served the Lord with. So at the course of his time, now he's equating Onesimus to these beloved brothers he's mentioned in what scripture talks about as a beloved brother. If we look, for example, it's going to be at uh, Ephesians 6.21. At Ephesians 
In the same way, when you see another beloved brother. So now Onesimus being counted as such and being told to Philemon, you equate, equate them as such. So Ephesians 6.21 Peter says, For that you know I do. A beloved brother, the respected brother, and a faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things. We'll see this come up again. We'll see Tychicus come up again with Onesimus in Colossians. That comes up later on. But we Tychicus is a brother beloved. So we see this. I believe the verses that we see this happen is in Colossians chapter 4. We go there now. Colossians 4, verse 7. You see, these two are more so paired up. Colossians 4, verse 7. Is a you know, verse that we've been almost referring to every week because this is where you see an essence later on in life. He says in the Colossians 4 7, he says, All my state shall Tychicus, there he is again, Tychicus, to you who, who is a beloved brother, again, a beloved brother, and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might state and comfort your heart. Because with this, so there's an essence again, very person that's being uh, stated. In the book of Philemon, and there he is with Tychicus, a beloved brother. So it's no coincidence that you have beloved brothers, and Tychicus is one, and Onesimus is another, and yet they're side by side in the book of Colossians. It's no coincidence that we find him. So we see, um, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother, and a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of you shall make known unto you all things which are done here. And then you go on even to more. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and there's just a list of names that continue on. But now Onesimus is considered a faithful and beloved brother. Uh, those on see him in this, call it that, with saints that you see in the word of truth. He's gone from, as we said before, in previous weeks, being that runaway servant who has wronged uh, Philemon, possibly always Odin, to now being the higher... Spiritual giants, we call them. So we see that there, our beloved brother. So we see that there with Tychicus. If you look at uh, going back to the first verse in the book of Philemon, you see there it says, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow labor. So Philemon is also a dearly beloved brother. You see Timothy, you know, our brother, and Timothy, a brother as well. And there's some you know, brothers and beloved brothers in the word of truth, especially. You know, in Paul's epistles. But you're seeing everything from Timothy to Tychicus to Philemon to, to Paul himself. Now, in essence, this is being equated into that high spiritual giants. So we see that there. And so we're seeing, uh, as he says this in verse 16, not now as a servant, but about a servant, a brother beloved. That's what we're seeing here. Paul's already equating him and calling him a brother beloved as he has sent him back to. He's already saying this. And so we see that there. And he says, especially to me. So as Paul, I mean, uh, Onesimus has this uh, special relationship with Paul. And he's saying, he's, especially to me, is he a brother of love? Especially to me. So that Paul, Paul is doing something you know, from the idea of 2 Corinthians 9, 6, where he's like, yeah, I guess so. Or I guess I have to uh, allow Onesimus to go or. I'll do it just because I will. And say, to me, he's a brother, especially to me, a brother of love. This is what Paul is right. And so he knows it because he's also, as we studied before, he's, he's his you know, quote unquote spiritual father in the faith. He, got, he has begotten the gospel in the previous version of it. So we've seen this there. And then even at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, we saw this uh, before, but we want to look at this again. This is why he can say, it, especially to me, unless I'm a beloved brother. Verse 14. He says this to the Corinthians. He says, I write not these things to you, but as my beloved, for though you have ten, excuse me, ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Jesus have I begotten the gospel. The need for fathers, spiritual fathers. Give not all right doctrine, right information. That'd be First step, but also, as he's saying there, you know, being more than an instructor, but father to someone in the faith, it says that there. But if you look also, another verse is in Thessalonians, and I believe it's going to be First Thessalonians two eleven. 
First Thessalonians 2.11. He says, as ye know how we, talking to the Thessalonians, says how we exhorted and comforted and charged every you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you to his kingdom and glory. And then the, the popular verse, uh, for this cause also thank ye we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. But in verse it's in 11, saying, you know, uh, we uh, exhorted it and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. So he's saying that, you know, the father comforts and the father charges you know, his children. And the concept of, you know, spirit doctrines and everything else, that these three functions were things that were done and then say that this is well received as a brother beloved. And this to Philemon in verse 16. So we're saying that now is a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. Especially to me, but he's saying, but how much more, Philemon? How much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? And so, as is there to be, as a brother loved, as as a as a uh, believer in Christ and the gospel, Philemon is. But he's also referring to this idea of being a, even a city of Colossians, as a fellow Colossian. And so, when he says, you know, both in the flesh, well, they're both in the flesh. They're both living on the earth in the flesh as citizens of. Of Colossi as Colossians in the flesh. And, and as far as Colossi goes, that was, you know, a, uh, I had to write this down from the Encyclopedia, so I'll read it flat out. It says that the unexcavated site of Colossi near the mighty of uh, Hamas at the base of Mount Kadam in modern Turkey today. That's where it is in modern Turkey. That's where, if you were to try to look for Colossi, Find the city and find where was Philemon, find where was Onesimus, find them. It would be in, in modern Turkey. It, says, uh, it is located near the sites of Laodicea and Hierapolis, which also appear in the Bible. We've mentioned these cities before. That's pretty much a short paragraph on that. But in the flesh, they were both were, kind of goes with this. But he says, and also in the Lord. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, where Paul gives instructions concerning their relationship in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. You know, concerning the master servant relationship in the Lord, not just in the flesh as Colossians, instructions are given. And he says, uh, or starts saying, servants, verse 5, we'll go to 5. Be obedient to them that are masters according to the flesh. With fear and trembling, in the of Christ, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of uh, Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With will, doing service, as to the Lord, knowing that whatever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be free. And ye masters, the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your man heaven, neither is their respect of persons with him. You see a great deal of information given, especially in Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 5 and 9. Talking with the master and the servant relationship, you can see things in there saying, you know, forbear threatening. If, uh, pretty sure Philemon probably read Ephesians just as he was given his own personal uh, epistle, as he plugs in the doctrine together concerning the revelation of the mystery and the things therein, the things that have to do with everything. I'm sure he's seeing there uh, forbear threatening, knowing right? that you have a master in heaven. Consider that, on top of many other things. And then, uh, as Onesimus learned from Paul, he would say, you know, please, your master, not with thy service, but as a servant of Christ, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord. So they, they're all thinking about the doctrines that God gives out to mankind in dispensation of grace, especially to those that are saved. And they're considering thinking on things, you know, thinking on these things and putting things together. And things are working according to the doctrine according. So there and that's where we would go with we see that in verse 16 not now as a servant but above a servant a brother beloved especially to me but how much more unto thee both in the flesh and in the Lord so we see how this play out in verse 16 and then of course we go into verse uh, 17 as he continues on and he said if thou uh, receive him as myself so it's not there and then and the one's partners you know, a couple times we see it in the verse it is 
uh, or the idea of it at least, is where we're looking to go. And he says, I beseech thee for my son in essence, this is Philemon, chapter 1, verse 10. I beseech thee for my son in essence, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in the of the now profitable to thee, to me. But again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels. So we see the idea of being that there is this idea that he's you know, more than a partner, he's his own bowels that he's sending back. He's not sending back a servant, he's sending, he's sending his own bowels back. This, this concept is sending him back that way. So uh, this is in regards to this is the kind of partnership he's saying. If you consider, if you count for a partner, receive my own bowels back, receive a brother of love back to you, receive a business back. This is the kind of things that he's saying. If you look at Second Corinthians eight verse twenty three. Second Corinthians eight. Uh, verse 23. You see that Paul mentions he has um, co-laborers, yoke fellows, partners that he works with. And this is another example, just as we see it there where he says, if you consider me a partner, by Philemon, and the idea that there are partners, Paul, that he works with, yoke fellows, co-laborers, -labor you see in uh, 2 Corinthians 8.23, he says, Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren being inquired of. They are the messengers of churches and the glory. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our uh, boasting of uh, your behalf, on your behalf. So he's mentioning that there are two of them saying, you know, these guys are my partners, so therefore go ahead. And show the proof of your love to my partners and of our boasting on your behalf. Do this for my partners. So, this is the idea of where partnership is coming in with Paul and Titus. And we've looked at this before. This has been probably over a year, year and a half, two years ago. We're also seeing there with Philemon, as he says this to him in verse 7 If thou count me therefore a partner, you are seeing the idea that as co laborers and helpfulness and co workers. We see that plug in here. So he reads this there and he says, Receive as myself. Receive to receive as if you were me. So that's a big jump there as well. If we look at Romans chapter 15, verse 7. You see here this, this idea where he's saying, Receive him as myself. This is uh, like a great. Uh, impact to the situation there. He's more than just his own bowels. He's saying, receive him as if it were me myself. And so that makes that makes Philemon really have to consider what's coming back to him as far as an essence or an essence of the fact that an essence is back, that he's essentially supposed to be Paul himself that's come back. In the mindset of Paul's asking to consider. So we see there in verse uh, 7, Romans 15, 7. It says, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And we see this concept there. And as Christ has received us, we should receive another, welcoming one another. And Christ received us and so received one another in, in like manner. Again, this idea of you know, the substitutionary atonement type of idea. So we see this play out here. And this is what this is what is applied. So you see, receive us as if you were myself. You see that there. And the great issue took place on the cross. You see a little bit of that kicking in there as well. So the different situations that come up, whether it was Romans 15, 7, Philemon that we're looking at with the Mesimus in verse 17. Um, when we see that there, if we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that comes up again. And it explains the cross through substitution, substitutionary atonement and the great exchange, they call it, for the verse as far as righteous goes. He took our sin, we received his righteousness. In 5.21, where we read, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who do no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we see that plan out there. And so this is the idea where this comes into play. And so the definition of atonement, this is where we kind of see this as we're looking to verse 16, where Paul could say, receive him as myself. This, is, this atonement that explaining this. This is more grace in action. This is more where Paul is putting God's great doctrines of grace into action, saying, receive him as myself. Imagine going and saying that you want to tell another 
member of the body of Christ to receive another member of the body of Christ. They were Paul. They were pastor, uh, uh, whoever. Receive them as if you were this other person. Atonement. You're trying to explain this or make atonement. That type of. You're not making the atonement. You're allowing the grace doctrine. We see that there in verse, or, or the definition, I'm sorry, the definition of satisfaction for sins through a just sacrifice. We see that in 2 Corinthians 21. So the world, the world knows as a whole that there's a need for justice and retribution and properly, and avenge properly, and explaining it through the cross of Christ. Not everyone believes it, but the idea it takes time to explain it to individual is, uh, could be explained as far as God did not pass on justice. He allowed justice to take place through the cross of Christ. It was poured out on Christ. So he didn't, as far as, he didn't dismiss sin. Sin was made for. That's where we're going with this. And it was atoned for. So, so we see that atonement satisfies justice. We know that through, through the Psalms, Psalms 58. The first of that, verse 11. But you, know, you see a lot going on that uh, it makes forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation, justification, and sanctification possible. All these things that a mess of this is getting through the explanations of Paul to Philemon. These things are happening there. And even you can plug in further the brother principle, where this be from Onesimus into uh, the situation that he has with Philemon. If Onesimus were at one point the weaker brother because of what he had done and run away and grew accordingly, if he were that weaker brother in a situation where Philemon now has to go out of his way for Onesimus, and these are two brothers, Philemon being the stronger one, Onesimus being the weaker one, or at least the one who's growing at a, uh, he may be growing at a stronger rate, he may be growing at whatever rate he's growing at, but he would be the one who initially wronged or owed Philemon. Now, Philemon has to be the stronger brother to Onesimus. We read about those doctrines, too, concerning the weaker brother and the stronger brother. Even that may come into play, more than just the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. But a lot of verses come up in Philemon chapter 1, verse 17, concerning different doctrines, substitutionary atonement, the stronger, weaker brother. But for example, Romans chapter 14, verse 1. This is where that weaker brother... And he says here, him that is weak in the faith, uh, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. He says, uh, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. For who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth and falleth, yet he shall hold, uh, be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. So we see that in Romans 14, verses 1. We're talking about the weaker brother. Uh, we see this there. And it talks about um, the, the example of that in verse 2. One may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So we see that there. If you go into verse 15, I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, For, for that we then, that are strong, talking to Philemon in this case, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And in this situation, in the book of Philemon, we're seeing an us with someone who either put away quite a lot of infirmities or someone who's getting out of a lot of infirmities and needs the help of the stronger brother to handle his weaker brother predicaments. So we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Paul pretty much knows that Philemon knows this and he's sending an us to him. It says, let every one of us please his neighbor to, for his good to edification. He's knowing that the ultimate goal is to edify in essence, said Philemon. Sent him to Philemon to make sure that Philemon edifies in essence. It says in verse 3, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. It says that, verse 3, considering this. So we see these principles you know, kicking in. If we look even at Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 15. Ephesians 4.13. I'm sorry, 15. 4.15. This is what would have to happen with Onesimus to Philemon, Philemon to Onesimus. 
and Paul to Onesimus and Philemon. So the speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. But Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, meaning the messimus supplies something to the body of Christ. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so he goes on there, and then he goes on talking about the worthy walk in verse 17, not to walk as the other Gentiles, according to, you know, not in the vanity of their mind, so on and so forth. But we see this mentioned here concerning stronger, weaker brother, concerning substitutionary atonement, all from what we see in verse 17. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. We see a lot about our situation uh, concerning substitutionary atonement. Christ died for our sins. We see that see that there. We're seeing this also play out with Philemon and Onesimus. Paul's the one setting the scene for that. Verse 17. So we read that there. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. But this is something we're seeing play out here in verse, verse uh, 17. So as we go a little further into it, we'll see in verse 18, he goes on to say, if he hath wronged thee, or, oh, with the I'll put that on my account. So he's going forth, and we've looked at this before in weeks past, talking about if he's done some things to you, Philemon. If he's, and the, the if is, you know, Paul's going to make sure he covers his bases. He's going to, he's, he's probably spoken with an SMS again, just gauging where things could be by now as they speak in truth. With and he's going to write to Philemon, whatever he's done, uh, put that on mine account, not his. And this is what he's saying to him in order to make sure that grace is applied, in order to make sure the situation is reconciled. First Corinthians chapter 7 is a book, uh, a chapter of reconciliation. And it talks more so about all the different say, statuses, single, married, so on and so forth. Uh, but it's all about them being reconciled, no matter what the situation is. You see there in verse... 18, if he has wronged thee or owed thee, I'll put that on my account. Again, reconciliation, the idea of reconciling. And he says here, if he has wronged thee or owed thee, it could have been that he did wrong him and owes him quite a bit. Paul's, Paul's going to go forth and say, whatever it is, if he, if he destroyed the whole countryside, or if he just broke a base, if he broke a door handle when he ran away, whatever he did, whatever he broke a window, whatever he did, put that on my account. He did all three. Whatever, whatever it was that this brother has once did. And that goes to a point where we've heard before, at least I've heard before, that when it goes to speaking to somebody newly saved, uh, one of the things you can say is whatever you did before the cross, as in before you trusted the gospel, before the gospel saved you, before you understood what the gospel, and people may look back into their life. And they may start to feel guilty. Oh, I wish I had never did this before, did that before I trusted the gospel. I wish I never did X, Y, Z, or one, two, three before I trusted the gospel. Essentially what you're seeing there in uh, verse 18 is saying, whatever you did before the cross, before you trusted the gospel, it's, it's not put into your account. It's been wiped away. It's something that's been paid for. It's not something you don't need to dwell on. It's something that is in the sight of God, not not a point of reference, not a point of reference. You are a ambassador now who can go out. Your ambassador can go out and do what needs to be done. So I don't see that there, but it can be used for a testimony. It can be used for other things. But as far as the guilt part, as far as the part where you need to sit and feel guilty for hours and days and weeks and months, that part no longer needs to happen. Go out and say what you did before the cross, you know, that's something that doesn't need to be focused on. And in a guilty way, in a guilty way, you could actually use that if, the, if that works uh, to glorify God. But now it's a point of, it's a tool, your past is a tool uh, and a reference for how to glorify God rather than a sentence of guilt, so to speak. And we're seeing this at 18. If he hath wronged, Again, lessons. If you had wrong with your oath, you'll put that on my account. So you see that there. 
And so we see more references to coming up for the idea of wrong. If we look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2, we'll go to 2 Corinthians uh, 7, verse 2. When well, you look up, or I looked up, where else do we find the word wrong? And we see in um, 2 Corinthians 17, this is where Paul mentions it again. He says, you know, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. And he goes forth and he says this to the Corinthians. So we see this term wrong come up again. We look at 2 Corinthians 8, 23. I believe it comes up again here. And he says, uh, whether any do inquire of Titus, where we just a little bit before, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brother, and be inquired of. They are the messengers and churches in the glory of Christ. I, I, wrong verse. Let's see. Or an 18, I'm sorry. Uh, wrong verse. Uh, let me go to uh, Proverbs 8, 36. I'm sorry. Proverbs 8, uh, 36. It's looking at the wrong line there. But, uh, yeah, when we look at the idea of being wronged or the concept of how Paul uses the word wrong or how the Bible uses the word wrong, we'll go into even Proverbs. We'll get a spiritual lesson out of that. Proverbs 8, 36. And he says, uh, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. So we see the idea of wronged again. You're just going through Bible verses that have the word wrong. And I wanted to go through and see where that came up. You see it with Paul. You see it here in Proverbs. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. And you see that with the, uh, uh, I don't know what even the term is. The, 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 the book, rock, death, metal. Uh, that love me, love death. All they're, all they're loving is, is death type of stuff. And that's just a random example. They're, they're, they're loving these zombie type of stuff. I'll, I'll go off on a tangent with that. But they would rather love death. All that hate me love death. So they, they're haters of God and lovers of death. So that's just an example there. But when it comes to the idea of, you know, they've wronged. They've wronged in there. Else. We've seen examples of this here. But he said, you know, if he had wronged thee or oweth thee ought. When you look at more of owing, you see that in Romans 13, where Paul mentions, you know, the, the idea of owing again. Romans 13, 8. And he says, that's a good part here. If anyone owes, if anyone, uh, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. Like wronging and owing. Uh, again, more verses I'm trying to find, you know, where does Paul talk about owing anybody, or where's the doctrine for it, where's the instruction for it? Romans 13 eight says, Owe in anything, but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So he's essentially saying, Owe no man anything. And this is essentially what he's putting forth with Lessimus uh, to uh, Philemon and so on, with the idea of this. You see, this is Romans 13 eight. So it says, and then, of course, this is where we're going. This is, is put that on my account. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee, I'll put that on my account. So you see the word account come up, or that everyone has an account, quote unquote, that they're going to, essentially, it's going to be shown. You're, you're, you think of a bank account. You could use that as the example. Look at Romans 14 12, you know, put that on my account. If he wronged thee or other, put it on my account. If you look at Romans 14 12, eventually you're going to be giving an account. So we see where these terms come up. He says, uh, let's see, let's see where we uh, we're starting. We'll go in verse Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not, brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And uh, it goes on from there. But you see, giving an account. We'll, we'll all be individually giving an account of ourselves to God. The, the pastor won't do it. Uh, the religious individual won't do it. You know, family won't do it. Friends won't do it. You're going to do it, giving an account of what you did since the moment you were saved. Not before, but what did you do with the time you had since the moment you were saved? What kind of ministry did you? What kind of work did you? What sort of work did you? Was it Pauline work? Or did you follow Peter? Follow the twelve apostles. Follow the apostle John. 
follow Pastor Smith or Pastor Jones or Pastor whoever rather than Paul, that type of thing. So, so we see that in uh, Romans, Romans, Romans 14, 12, as far as be kept. Uh, we see that there and in Galatians 3, 6. Here's another example. Galatians 3, 6. Say, for even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, this works out well with 2 Corinthians 5.21, talking about how the great exchange, we receive Christ's righteousness to our account and to Christ's account when our sin. You see, just the example of that, not the verbatim words of 2 Corinthians 5.21, but we see here in uh, Galatians 3.6, even as Abraham believed God, God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. The accounting was done. So we see that there also. And Philippians 4 17. 17, again, something that can be, uh, that can abound in the account of the Philippians. He says, uh, For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Not literal fruit, but uh, you know, good works, fruit that may abound unto your account. That's works of Apollo. As they assisted Paul, they worked with Paul, they helped Paul with, with his ministry. Uh, fruit that may abound to their account. When they give an account at the judgment seat of Christ, as righteousness was already accounted to them, and they're already believers, fruit would abound to their account. So we do that there. Again, this idea of what we're looking at, the whole point of why we're seeing these verses, looking at these verses, is you know, the substitutionary atonement, everything else um, that we're plugging into verse 17, verse 18, that we're seeing as we look at and plug it into Philemon. So you see that there. But, you know, something was done for the place of someone else, or uh, something was put into the account for someone else. This is the idea of substitutionary atonement, the account that we're seeing. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee, I'll put that on my account. Atonement, we see that even in Romans 5.11. It says, it draws our attention to the work of Christ, which is done now. If we look at Romans chapter 5, verse 11. We'll stay in Romans 5 for a moment because we're going to keep reading a little more. Romans 5.11, atonement, substitutionary atonement, what, what uh, Paul is doing for Onesimus to Philemon. Peter says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Israel hasn't received it yet. We have. As members of the body of Christ, the moment we believe the gospel. And then so we see that in verse uh, Romans 5.11. So Romans 5 deals with you know, a new man, the new man, a new creature made uh, in Christ and not in Adam. This continues on in verse 12, saying, Wherefore, as by one man and sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that would. When is the offense, so also is the free gift. You see that there. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the great God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. See this here. And not as it was by one a sin, so was the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but so many offense unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, see that, imputation, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. We see atonement, imputation, all sorts of things. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, atonement, imputation, not so much atonement, but imputation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. You see that here. So, uh, the obedience of one shall be shall many be made righteous in verse 19. It goes on to explain that there. So it's by Jesus Christ our Lord in verse 20. So this is where this idea of atonement continues on as we're 
plugging it into Philemon verses 16, 17, and 18. It goes on and says that there. But as we believe this, study the doctrine, read the verses, and believe what we read, seeing that sin is no longer the problem. It's a, that we're dead in Christ and we're risen in Christ. These are uh, truths. These are truths of our identity, which we were looking at earlier. Christ is our atonement now. So therefore, we're not waiting for it. So before we go to verse 16, 17, and 18, we're seeing that he says, the serving, but above a servant. Brother, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Thou count me therefore a partner. Receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. Of course, he stops there, and actually, he doesn't stop there. This is kind of where we're, we're stopping for today, but we'll pick up and continue on uh, verse 19, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of stop here ourselves just to open it up for any kind of thoughts or comments or questions on what we're just went through. We're seeing, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand is the next verse. I will repay it. So Paul's even saying he's going to repay it. We'll get to that next time. He says, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. So that's something we can do a little more later. Uh, more about Philemon, Mayo, Paul, and Paul's wife, he met that clear. More to look into that next time. So, uh, for that, we'll... Uh, We'll close on uh, this for this week's first, uh, next three verses. But uh, do you want to see if anyone had any thoughts or comments on what we just went through? And uh, we're going to go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it if I turned my back or my ear on, the, on what you were talking about. But when you were talking about, um, you know, I wish I hadn't have done that. You know, before uh, you know, when I wasn't saved, and and you said that you know Christ, uh, you know, covers that whatever you did before. I, I just want to make sure that that we say that Christ's grace covers us, past, present, and future. Oh yeah. So I, you know, and I know what you know when when you're doing a lesson, you know, you you're you're kind of in a different world, and when. <laughs> When I speak, and you know, I may not cover everything, or I may not, or I may say something wrong. Not that you did, but I just want to make sure that that it, even if Onesimus was saved and did this to uh, Philemon, I mean, he he would should still be forgiven, or Christ will forgive him, God will forgive him, you know. But he still has to deal with the uh, ramifications of yes, yeah. of the world. Yes system you know like if i rob a bank god's not going to kick me out but i may not be living in my right. so, so yeah. that's all i had yeah no no you're right that's that's, good, that's, that's good. a good point yeah it's a great point it's a great point absolutely great yeah what paul talked about a lot today was forgiveness i think uh and paul obviously was a forgiving person when you get to Second Timothy and, and Paul is about to be sacrificed, he knows it. He's thanking those in Second uh, Timothy 4. He comes to Alexander the coppersmith and he says he did a much evil. Uh, the Lord reward him according to his works. Now, obviously, Paul's not saying Lord reward him like, like the reward we see in 1 Corinthians 5. Is Paul saying, what is Paul saying? Well, he's going to say Alexander, Alexander the coppersmith. doesn't sound like in this reference, in that reference, that he's a saved individual. So if he's going to be rewarded, you could be rewarded, you know, get your just desserts by being a bad person. And, you know, you let the punishment fit the crime. Could be, even if you go to the great white throne, and you have to give an account for millions of millions of sins. And say, you know, you you were you had the gospel and you rejected it. Why'd you do that? Since you rejected the only thing I can pay for millions and millions of sins, now you have to pay for millions and millions of sins. Explain, if you can, why you did so many sins or at least rejected. Why did you reject the gospel? So when he gets to, when Alexander gets to that point, he's already gotten to that point, obviously. He's been judged. I would think, right? I mean, not at the not at the Great White Throne, 
because that comes later, right? That he's he that hasn't happened yet. No, as to I mean that that'll happen in yeah. Russia, but he's I mean he's essentially he's someone who's already died in right. time past. Right, would be in, in hell now if they haven't trusted the gospel. No, okay. no, no, no. Okay, no, is that what them. Paul's saying here? Yeah, Lord reward yeah. him accordingly to what he did to me. So the reward is in a positive word, maybe. Right, in that right, right, right. It's, right. it's like that's why I said it's yeah. not the reward, positive reward, right, that we see in First right, Corinthians right. five. And it's like, and it's like Gene said, they have to, they have to reap what they sow. They have to, uh, you know, and they, and, and even reaping what you sow by trusting the gospel and having a terrible past, you can reap that comfort of the gospel, but you still got to pay for, or to, you know, you got to pay for what you've done in light of your situation. Sort of like that saying, um, to get your just dessert. Exactly. <laughs> kind of the same way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Today we today we use the word reward as positive, but, yeah. but really, it really does cover both. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yep. so. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So if I uh, Anesimus. Going back, he, they may he gone he may go back as a beloved brother, and he may have gone back as uh, as uh, Paul's own battles. But Philemon may have said, you know, it may take some time. Yeah. You know, I'll do everything Paul says. Paul, I'll, I'll let you in. I'll, I'll highly esteem you. Eventually, I'll do everything that Paul says. If, if you can do this for thirty days, I, mean, I don't know what you do. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm going to keep my eye on you. I'm going to keep my eye on you for a little bit, but then if you can hold this up until uh, for 90 days, 60 days, maybe he said that, maybe he didn't. Yeah. Then, then I will do everything that Paul said in this letter. Who knows? I don't know. Well, it sounds like Philemon would have done that anyway. Done everything he said. Yeah. Because he's that kind of brother. So yeah, yeah. He could have read the letter and instantly said, you know what? If this is Paul telling you this, then I don't need 30 days. I don't need 30 seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will instantaneously. Yeah, I will continue yeah. equal with Paul. Yeah, if yeah. he trusts an then well, I'll he trust. Yeah, if he trusts, if he trusts Paul, you just say Paul wrote this. Done deal. Well, he's he's just referencing. You know, he's yeah. he's uh, standing up for him or whatever. I'm yeah. trying to think of the right yeah. word, but vouching for. Yeah. Well, and if Onesimus came with a humble, very humble attitude, knowing he did wrong and knowing that he's experiencing great grace, I mean, that would make a difference too in how Philemon felt. Yeah, Onesimus yeah. well, probably apologized to him too. Sure. Back and said, "Look, I'm sorry that I that I did this to you, but I changed." Yeah. Or, or I mean, I didn't or, say that. Yeah. Well, who knows? Yeah, he probably didn't say that. But. Yeah, you opened a can of worms when you did last week's uh, Wednesday study yeah, well, because okay. I kept thinking about that, and I thought, well, perhaps the letter was sent ahead uh, because he. Even you said here he will do nothing without Philemon's consent. So maybe he didn't even send him back until maybe he heard back from Philemon and said, "Okay, I agree, send him back." Yep. You know, so I mean, there's so many scenarios. You just got my head all buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but these are three powerful verses, and there's so much in there, and you mind it so you know, like digging, you yeah. mind it very well as far as pointing out the important issues. Yeah. Like you said, for a small book, one chapter. Yeah, you will be going into week six next week. And the thing that strikes me a little bit about these studies is you don't hear this in church. You you never would hear it in a... Well, you don't hear it in the building. Well, no. Well, I'm saying, you, well, if you don't hear it there, you're not going to hear it. I mean, as far as well, a Baptist church, a Catholic church, and yeah, all those other things. Church. Yeah, but we're the church. Yeah, we're the church. But I guess what's... There was something else that struck me that you had said, and I, I forget what the reference was to, but it struck me that that the Catholic Church happened to be really um, indicative of what you were talking about. And I don't remember what the reference was necessarily. Anyway. That's what happens. You know. That's why I take notes. <laughs> Nice. That's yeah, that nice. is nice. very nice. I, I'm not, I'm not the preacherly type like John or Justin or Jeremy. Um, I, I'm, I'm not geared for that. 
but I am geared for, you know, writing, creating tracks and writing things so that people have it in hand. It's just another mode or method to get stuff to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I handed a card out to a cashier the other day and she was like totally confused. Like, what is this? So maybe it, maybe it'll spark something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The members are many. Yeah. So that, that's my, that's my gig. I write and I try to edify the saints, you know, when we have our discussions here and, and elsewhere. So. Um, Nice. I don't know if you. Sounds familiar. Yeah, tall guy, Texan. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. So he does a Bible study on Thursdays too. Anyway, he, since they didn't come to the seminar this year, he they miss us. His wife had had a stroke a couple of years back, so she she's doing well, but she misses us too. So we they've arranged for us and them and a third couple. Uh, from their Bible study to to meet for a weekend at the end of March, so we should have some good edification there. Oh, nice, good. Uh, and it's only like five hours to Tyler, Texas. So, um, so hopefully we'll have some good conversation and and fellowship there. Um, that's all I got. I think good to hear yeah. y'all. And uh, yeah, you too. Does anyone else have any other thoughts or comments or anything based on what we studied or anything else that anyone else is go studying, going through? <laughs> well, thanks again. Bye, everyone. Hey, yeah, bye. bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks. We'll be here Wednesday, everyone. Yeah. See ya. Grace and peace, everybody. <laughs>